Hello. Day two, day two of DrupalCon. <laughs> Everyone excited? Everyone still happy to be here? Yeah, great. I love this room with the round tables. It's very cool. Okay, we're going to get started, and today we'll be talking a bit about accessibility, but through the lens of the content life cycle. So for content publishers in the room, anyone here responsible for publishing content, this is going to be directly relevant. Anyone in here more of a site builder or like Drupal developer, providing tools maybe for those content publishers, so there'll be also lots of great stuff for you. And anyone here a designer? Yeah, I love, I love it when designers come to DrupalCon. We should have more designers in the room. So very happy to have you and happy to have everyone here, no matter what your background. Um, so we'll get started with some intros. So for those of you who haven't met me, my name's Suzanne Dergacheva. I'm one of the co-founders of Evolving Web, an agency here sponsoring DrupalCon. Um, we do a lot of uh, accessibility work, especially in government and higher ed space. And uh, I also run the Promote Drupal initiative. So if you happen to be interested in uh, marketing and want to contribute to Drupal, I would also love to talk to you about that. And my email address is up here, so you can always reach out. And I'm here today with my colleague, Jesse. Great. So yeah, my name is uh, Jesse. I am a uh, solutions architect uh, in, uh, in, in, at Evolving Web. Um, so yeah, we are both based in uh, Montreal, and we're happy to be here to talk about just how we you know, handle accessibility throughout uh, the publishing life cycle. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, what is web accessibility? Um, I think it seems like probably there's a good chance that everybody knows what it is already. Is there anybody that maybe isn't so familiar with, with what we're talking about with accessibility? That would be a no. That's actually quite a, gr a great thing. That's, that's really happy, makes me happy to hear. Um, so, I mean, this is sort of a, a great description. It's just the inclusive practice of building websites that are usable by everyone, regardless of their ability or disability. Um, that has a lot uh, in there, but it basically just means, you know, we want, we want everybody to be able to use uh, the websites. Um, so, uh, really, when we're talking about disabilities, it kind of falls into uh, four different categories. We have uh, visual disabilities, and so people that might have blindness or low visions or color blindness, um, auditory disabilities like uh, deaf or hard of hearing, uh, and of course, you know, uh, motor disabilities, maybe with uh, limited motor abilities or uh, perhaps you know, joint pains or some, some issues like, like that. Uh, there's also uh, cognitive disabilities. Um, you know, like dyslexia, for example, is always a, 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 an example that's often used. Um, so those are the you know, very brief introduction into, into some of those. Um, when we start to uh, think about building websites for disabilities, or in fact maybe you know, mobile apps or, or various things, uh, there's really these sort of four main uh, principles for well, what we want to think of. And we often use the acronym POR, and so what that means is uh, perceivable, operable, uh, understandable, and uh, robust. Um, so if you think about what operable means, it's kind of the inter, uh, oh, sorry, I should start with the, the first one. Um, perceivable uh, is you know, the, how the information can be perceived by various people, uh, if, it, if it actually can be uh, perceived. Uh, a common example of that is when you start thinking about you know, text alternatives for non-text content, uh, captions on videos, those kinds of things. Uh, if we think about what is uh, operable, um, that's you know the uh, uh, functionality, for example, or, or how we interact with the, the content. So functionality is available from the keyboard, for example. Uh, if if you can navigate through a website or an app through through the keyboard, um, and uh, if you just have enough time to actually see and 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 understand the, the content. So for example, you know sliders that are moving maybe a little bit too fast or or can't actually be paused. Um, so it's things like that. Understandable, is the text actually able to be understood by somebody? We might think about things like low contrast um, or you know, uh, language that maybe is too difficult for some people to understand. Uh, and then just you know, robust content, maybe content that's uh, uh, more accessible to different uh, levels of technology, uh, that, that's valid and sort of like future-proof markup when we talk about uh, HTML, uh, so you know, things like that. 
So what are the benefits of accessibility? Well, I think the main benefit just kind of speaks for itself. It's making sure that everybody can understand and use the content that we all here are, are trying to, to convey to, to, to people. Um, so making sure that that audience is as, as wide as possible and not excluding anybody. There's also some other benefits too, like SEO. Uh, if we're making our content very structured and easy for machines and for, for, for rather for, for people to understand, it makes it easier for machines to understand as well. Um, and then there's legal compliance as well. That's becoming more and more, we, we keep hearing about that through all the other accessibility sessions. It's, it's more and more of a, of a thing. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, well, it is just only gonna become more and more important as we, as we move forward. So um, I think we're pretty well covered with that, when, with that in the room here, though everybody is, it seems to be pretty uh, aware of that already, so that's great. Yeah, and if we think about um, the different uh, criteria for accessibility that Jesse was talking about. Um, I feel like content accessibility is one of the hardest ones to actually achieve. Um, and that's because it's, it's hard to automate the testing for content accessibility. And it's also something um, where we're always adding content to our websites. And so there's this continued challenge. There's a sustained effort needed to keep um, to keep testing for content accessibility. And that's why we thought this session would be useful um, to give some, some tips and some clues as to how that content accessibility maintenance can um, be part of your organization. Um, and so we'll just get started. So at, um, we've already kind of talked about who's in the room, but content accessibility is really a, a shared responsibility between a lot of people on your team. Um, now, you might be all of these people at your organization, <laughs> and so maybe you feel solely responsible. But generally, there's more than one person involved in write, you know, writing the pub content, getting it published, um, maintaining the Drupal website or the other websites on which that content gets published and then you know social media folks and other people involved and everyone kind of shares the responsibility because they're um, managing the process or um, deciding how much time you get to publish content and that all has an impact. So I've, um, or Jesse and I have kind of organized the session into these different steps of a content publishing cycle. Now your exact content publishing cycle is probably different from this, um, but hopefully there's enough resemblance that you'll be able to get something out of this, that there'll be some of the steps that are similar to your steps. Um, and I would love to hear if you have other parts of content publishing that you do that, um, that are different than this that you'd like us to speak to. So please, please hang on to your, your questions and we'll make sure there's time. Um, so to start off, um, content might start with somebody asking for the content to be written. And sometimes this is done more informally, but sometimes there's an official content brief written. Um, uh, you might also have a template for content that you have somewhere. Does anyone here use content briefs? Or maybe you have some kind of a, a Google Doc template for certain types of content that outlines here's how it should be written. You know, he, we always need to have a title and some tags and the body text. Um, your content might not start off on the, you know, on the Drupal website itself. Somebody might be writing it in another in another platform, um, and in any case, there's probably some kind of request going out about the content. And even at that stage, um, it's, it's interesting how accessibility plays a role. Like, if you're asking someone to write content, maybe at that point, even, we need to be reminding them that this content needs to be accessible. So when you're writing the title, when you're um, structuring the content, um, and even when you're deciding who the audience is and what reading level you want to write for, um, that is all going to play into the eventual accessibility. So if you're using templates for writing content, if you're using content briefs, um, just you know, hinting at the fact that accessibility needs to play a role at this stage can save you time later on in the publishing um, life cycle. Um, you can also use this opportunity to link to things like style guides or, or templates that you're using, um, and those should also include your accessibility guidelines. So the next phase of the process is, is probably writing the content, actually um, you know, going from the blank slate to 
having words on the page. Um, and at this point, there's several things that come into play in terms of accessibility, right? So we have, um, we want the content to be understandable, so reading level is really important. Um, and typically content can be written for, you know, a grade six reading level, um, but that might vary depending on your exact audience or if it's a, you know, government-based website. Um, we also want to be thinking right away about heading structure. Heading structure has an incredible impact on how people navigate and skim through your content. Um, you know, it's likely someone's not going to read an entire page and might want to jump to one section. Um, so having really clear uh, headings and make sure, making sure that your heading structure is, um, you know, always hierarchical. Is, you know, starts right at the writing stage. And then link text, really hard to write link text, so we're gonna get into some details on that. Okay, and uh, with respect, you know, Suzanne mentioned about, about the reading levels and how, you know, we can um, basically make content so that it is, uh, again, understandable, readable uh, by certain uh, audiences and so um, it you know the, the the exact needs might end up depending on uh, you know or exact sorry the exact reading levels might end up depending on your exact needs for for your audience uh, but you in in a lot of cases if you're dealing with you know public institutions those kinds of websites it might be that we're looking for a, a grade eight uh, a, a level of, of reading uh, yeah so the ways that you can do that is to, you know, simply write with very plain text. Use a plain text approach as much as possible. You know, short sentences, simple terms, um, removing any sort of jargon, uh, even things like, you know, defining uh, acronyms so that, you know, maybe somebody doesn't understand a certain acronym that might be in your industry that, that, that would be best to actually spell that out um, at, at a certain point in the, in the content. Uh, using lists makes content just easier to understand, to parse. Basically, you know, general formatting can be really helpful to be able to, to do that. And, and really, there's a whole bunch of different tools that we can use to, to start to write some of this. You know, if you're not writing your, your content directly in, uh, in Drupal or directly in, um, uh, you know, Google Docs or something like that, you can use some of these other tools. Like, this is the, the uh, readability uh, service here that, that'll help you to really, you know, refine that content and get it ready for... Uh, for that specific level of uh, reading level that you need to be compliant with. So the reading level uh, is a uh, success criterion for the WCAG uh, and it is a uh, level, uh, oftentimes level double A, sorry, triple A. Um, and so, you know, again, we can sort of uh, address that in a few ways. There's some tools that might help with respect to crawling your whole website and telling you, is some of this content actually meeting that level? Uh, so, you know, one of them, for example, might be, uh, this is a, a screenshot from a, a tool called Dubbot that, that, that we use um, to help us figure out what the, the reading level is of, of certain content. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones, like the readability app that I just showed. There's also another one called Hemingway app that is a really nice web-based tool that can help you to write your content directly in that editor or paste it from somewhere else, uh, and then it'll help you to, to identify and sort of update your, your content. Microsoft Word uh, actually is another good one too if you have a certain, certain levels of, of their subscriptions has uh, some of this analysis built right in to be able to tell you what that reading level is. So if, if you're using that, that, uh, you know, that tech stack, you can actually just use a word and it'll, it'll help you with that. So there's some, some good documentation based on how to, how to go about doing that. So an interesting thing about um, heading structure is that it, it turns out that heading structure is one of the main ways that screen reader users navigate through websites. Um, so if we're looking at, um, uh, th this is actually the results of a survey of screen reader users um, to ask them um, various questions about their, their behavior, their usage habits. Um, and one of the questions is about, you know, how do you navigate a page that's very lengthy? And by far the top choice is heading, heading structure. So that's just to give you a bit more motivation that it's not just about using headings, but it's about having headings that are really clear and that actually describe the content. Um, so, 
you know, if you're writing content that's really marketing heavy, maybe your headings are just kind of there to catch people's attention, but having them actually describe the content on the page is, is going to be more useful for folks. And then to maybe get a little bit to how we can, you know, how Drupal can help us with that, um, there are certain ways that we can actually customize uh, the CK editor specifically uh, and how it can support us in being able to actually write good content directly in Drupal. Or maybe it's after you're bringing it into Drupal, it can help us to, to address some of these things. Um, so some of that goes back to just you know, how, how the CK editor is configured. There's a lot of options that we can actually do in, directly in Drupal. Now that might not be relevant for everybody here if you're not the administrator of your site, but you can still talk to your teams and figure out how you can do some of this. So for example, we can do things like removing the H1 as a available heading level in, in the editor so that you know, chances are your uh, developers have the site set up so that the theme provides, or the template provides you that uh, heading level one. Uh, and providing a second one in the content might be confusing. Uh, it might be duplicate. Uh, so you might not actually want to expose that. Um, there's also you know, different ways that we can create additional styles uh, in CK Editor so that somebody can use the, 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 the right formatting. Can, can, the editor can provide those controls to give the right formatting and not you know, in, encourage the use of, of the wrong uh, markup or the wrong uh, content structure in there. Um, this here is actually another example is that you can enable the language selector. Uh, so that you know, if you have a multilingual website, maybe you have content in French or in Spanish as well as English, um, you might even have articles that switch between or that reference other languages. Uh, that would be quite confusing to somebody if all of a sudden it just switches to another language in a screen reader. So you can actually designate that content as being in another language. Uh, so that's a, a helpful one. And all, a lot of this is built, some of this is built right in already. That language panel, I believe, was, is actually already available in uh, in Drupal, you just need to actually add it to your CK Editor toolbar. Another way that, you know, Suzanne mentioned earlier about link text, that is another way to, of course, to navigate around your page, but also um, a way to navigate to other pages. Um, so what somebody is navigating to is kind of going to be a good question if they are using the keyboard to navigate your website and land on a link that says read more. Uh, and then the next link might also say read more, and the next one, and the next one. Um, so it gets kind of difficult for somebody who's navigating around your website to understand what they're going to be navigating to if a link simply just says read more. Uh, some of that might be a bit more, you know, on the maybe in the back end for the developers to solve in the, in the templating of the site. But it's also important to keep that in mind when writing your content that that link might be all that somebody is going to see and understand um, of your. Of, of, the, of the website, that link text. Um, so if it's not descriptive of where they're actually going to go to, it's going to be very confusing. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind in the, in the writing phase and then when you're actually adding the links in the content, that that link uh, should be very descriptive in terms of where somebody is going to. Um, so, so trying to stay away from those kinds of click here as your link text or read more um, is, is very helpful. Uh, and, and similarly, even when, you're, when it's going to download a file, if you're linking to a uh, PDF, for example, um, indicating that that's going to happen will help somebody to not get confused when all of a sudden the website pops up a, a, you know, something that they weren't expecting. And for those who aren't familiar with what you're seeing on the, the, the screen here, um, this is showing us if you're using a screen reader and you decide you want to uh, be able to get a list of all the links on the page. It's one of the common ways to navigate through a site is just, you know, tell me what all the links are and it will read through all the links on the page. And so if you, uh, what you're seeing here is kind of a, a visual um, version of what gets read out by the screen reader and on this sample website that we found, you know, there's um, a few links that maybe are understandable and after that we just have read more, read more, read more, which is obviously not useful for the person to figure out what link makes most sense to click on. And so when you are maybe creating some of this content, um, there's various ways that you can look at how this is, 
how this has been set up, if it's accurate, if it's going to be useful. Uh, so there's various tools that you can use. One of the probably the best ones for analyzing link text is called Wave. Uh, it's a browser extension that you can install just in your browser, uh, and it will analyze your page for you, just like you see here, and show you uh, if some of those links are, are have suspicious link text, as they call it. Um, so we can see that it just says read more, uh, and that's, that's not going to be enough. Uh, that's a, a button that was probably added in the template of that, of that, uh, of that website. Um, so wh what I'm showing here also is basically how we might handle that you know, from a developer uh, mindset or um, you know, just when you go into the sort of view source mode of the CK editor, you can actually add some, there's different ways of doing this, but we can add some uh, hidden text basically to help explain where somebody's going uh, such that it won't necessarily affect the visual uh, layout of the page. So we don't want, you know, we want a, a, a nice clean button for, uh, for on the visuals of the, of the page, but we also want to tell somebody who maybe can't interpret those visuals uh, where they're going to go. Uh, so we can do that with just a little bit of simple HTML. So if it's something that, you know, in a certain part of your life cycle, you might need to involve a developer to help you add that in, or maybe they can give you some additional tools to help you do that as well. Oh, just to, to highlight that, that actual uh, error message there. Okay, and then uh, for images, uh, I would say one of the most common things when we think about accessibility that's, that's going to be mentioned is uh, alt tags or alt text or alt, alt, basically alternative text for an image. Uh, and so that is incredibly important because if somebody is not able to perceive an image on your website, they won't really know what, what it was that you were trying to show with that image. Uh, so it's, it's again, important to, if you're adding an image into your content, to add that, that alt text. And in most cases, Drupal's already configured to require that. Um, and that can be you know, uh, both, both good and bad. Um, there are some cases where you actually don't want uh, alternative text if it's duplicated, if it's just a, an image that doesn't actually, that's just a decorative. Uh, so there's some, you know, some nuance in there, but in general, do consider adding uh, you know, alt text to your images as you're adding it in. That's probably a good thing to also consider earlier on when you're actually writing the content. Again, that can be part of the content uh, brief. I think it's one thing we often get hung up on on content publishing cycles is, uh, oh yeah, someone has to find the right image to use. And knowing in advance, like, is this image actually supposed to be part of the content or is it serve as a decorative image or is it a background image that has to have certain um, contrast uh, considerations? This can be kind of part of what you ask for when you're defining what the content needs to be. Yeah, so, and, and, and there are those few special cases that I, that I was mentioning there. Um, a, an image that is purely decorative, maybe it's just an icon that doesn't actually, you know, convey anything in the content. Uh, we actually want to just leave, you know, in the, in the underlying code for that image, we just want to leave the alternative text basically as empty. Uh, we don't want to actually exclude the alternative text. We want to say it's specifically, explicitly empty. Uh, and that way, you know, the, a screen reader, for example, will know that this isn't something that's necessary to read out. Otherwise, it might do something um, really unfortunate, like maybe reading out the file name, which probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, also, avoiding having text inside images. Um, that oftentimes can, you know, somebody who can't perceive the image won't be able to perceive that text in there. Also, it gets really difficult with contrast as well. Uh, if it's text on top of an image, oftentimes that image has varying levels of contrast with the background and, and whatnot. So just simply, you know, trying to avoid that where you, where you can is oftentimes the, 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 the better approach for that. The other big special case is around more complex images. So for example, for a chart. Uh, it might be really hard to write an alternative, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a concise alternative text for a chart like this. Uh, and so again, this is somewhere where maybe a developer might be able to help with crafting the right uh, uh, markup for your post. Uh, but you can actually add then what we know as uh, like a caption, and you can describe it in a little more detail, which will be helpful to probably to everybody using your website, not just for those that need that extra description. Um, you would still need the actual alternative text just to say something more simple, but uh, you, know, you can go into much more detail in that caption where you can really start to, to add a lot more content in there. And then even in some cases, linking to 
another web page that might have more detail around that, uh, that might provide a lot more context for people that, that really need that. This, the, by default, the CK editor does give you that ability to add a caption, at least in, in Drupal 10. So that's already there. You just have to know to basically to use it. Uh, so hopefully now you, you do if you, if you didn't already. And just to add to that, if you ever have uh, an image field on a certain type of content where you're always going to have some kind of diagram or graph that needs more explanation, then you can build that right into the media type itself, right? So you can have a field on your diagram image that's, um, you know, uh, details or, you know, uh, source, source data um, that's going to allow you to link to that information that's actually fueling a, or, you know, powering a, a graph like this. Okay, and so let's say now we have all of our content uh, uploaded into the website, um, and we want to test it now. We, we think that we've done everything, but now it's time to actually test it. So uh, there's a couple of other tools that we've already kind of mentioned, like Wave might be helpful here. Uh, there's some others like uh, Axe uh, Dev Tools uh, for, again, another browser extension that you can install. Um, there's also some tools that we like to use that help us to basically crawl the entire website so that we can look at things more holistically, which is good also for you know, longer term monitoring too, as content is changing, new content's being added or updated. Uh, using some of these tools will help to notify you maybe if something got updated later and wasn't done so just in the right way. Um, so we use a whole bunch of them. Uh, we do use, for that, we use these two uh, specifically, uh, Dubbot and, and Source Site. Um, we find that it is always helpful to use multiple tools because they do oftentimes have specific focuses or um, strengths in certain areas. So we do kind of you know, go back and forth between the, the, the tools that we use, and it's pretty helpful. Some will surface some things, and some you know some will, will surface others. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate, but not every tool is gonna is gonna catch everything in this in this sense. Um, Dubbot specifically also has a nice uh, Drupal integration, uh, so it will help to surface some of these directly into Drupal. So you know the admins or the content editors can can see it right into Drupal, in, right while in Drupal, and not have to sort of go off the site immediately to see how things are changing. Uh, so it's it's a nice report. Uh, it will then basically take you into Dubbot to get a little bit deeper into some of the the content. But it's nice to have that right in one spot, and you can see if there's any new errors that are popping up as your content is is shifting. Okay, so um, I'll move on to talk a little bit about um, a style, having a style guide for your website. Um, so even as a uh, you know content publisher who's maybe not the designer on the project, it's still really useful for you to have an awareness of your style guide because often you're having to make choices um, about images that get used that actually introduce a, a color into the site. Sometimes you're embedding a form from somewhere else where maybe there are styles that have been applied. Um, and so knowing about your style guide and making sure that you have enough contrast always between um, between text and background colors uh, is always good, just kind of knowing the best practices. Who, who here, when they're publishing content, also do you have um, options around the styling of the content? Some of you. I know sometimes we're um, asked to, you know, create components that are really flexible in terms of styling. Like you can go in and pick the background color of, of a component, um, and it's not, even just a matter of like, oh, you pick between two or three options, but rather, here's a color wheel. And I always get scared when I see things like that, like, oh, no one should ever at the phase of writing content be asked to choose from a color wheel of, you know, any color in the rainbow. But, you know, these Drupal sites do exist. So if your site has something like that where there's um, styling flexibility, then it's really, um, at least essential that the content authors have some training around you know, color contrast and what are the three options that they should pick from. Um, having that documented somewhere would be really advantageous. Um, who here uses PDFs on their website? Don't be shy, you all do. <laughs> Everyone's got at least one PDF. 
<laughs> so of course, you know, when we talk about accessibility, we are always, you know, try to be very good and say, no, we're not going to, we're going to move away from PDFs and just have web content because we know that that's better. And that same, um, um, that same survey that I was showing you earlier, uh, certainly users of screen, re screen readers are going to tell you that PDFs are um, not fun to deal with and often <laughs> really interfere with their experience. Um, but that being said, if you, you are using PDFs, there's ways to make them much more accessible. Uh, and that doesn't start with the moment when you're publishing the content, but actually the moment when you're deciding to create the PDF. Um, so if you're using, um, um, if you're using well-structured content in your um, editor when you're actually um, authoring a PDF, you are going to end up with better structured content in the PDF itself and it'll be easier for somebody to navigate through it. So basically all the best principles that we have for um, using headers and um, proper link text in a website, we can also apply those to the PDF uh, authoring. So if you're writing the PDF originally in Word um, or in Google Drive, you know, using the um, heading options instead of just making things bold, uh, just best practices like that are going to lead to better quality output. Um, and then also when you're actually um, taking that document and turning it into a PDF, exporting it instead of printing to PDF is going to preserve all that structure instead of just basically making an image of, of what you've done. Um, so rather than just say, don't ever create a PDF, um, try to have these best practices available to the folks making the PDFs so that they can at least create things that are as accessible as possible. Um, there's also an accessibility checker in Acrobat Pro, so you can test your PDF before you're publishing it. Um, and then the other word of advice I would have is just to try to get folks to use templates. So rather than every single PDF being different and having different accessibility issues, um, try to get people to standardize. That way, if there is an accessibility issue um, or if something pops up in the future that like, oh, to comply, you know, your PDFs have to have X, Y, Z, at least all your PDFs will have the same problems and it'll be easier to solve. Um, so um, just a bit of advice around PDFs and again, something to think of as part of the publishing uh, process. Oh yeah, and here's some of that feedback from screen reader users about um, whether PDFs pose uh, significant issues. So most say very likely or somewhat likely is the, the vast majority. No, extra motivation. <laughs> okay, and then now we're at the posting our content to social media phase. Um, so. You know, you have your content ready to go. You're ready to publish it. I published one yesterday on LinkedIn about this very session. Uh, I thought it would be a good chance to take a couple of screenshots and make sure that that the uh, uh, image was was accessible to to the audience. Um, so a few things, and actually, in reality, all the same rules are going to apply here. We want to keep the uh, text uh, simple and easy to understand. Um, uh, we want to make sure that you know we're, we're checking it for accessibility, that it is gonna gonna meet all those requirements. Um, one great way to do that is just simply to read it out loud what you are trying to post and making sure that it, you know, it, it sounds okay to you. Um, so that includes things like just making sure that it's grammatically correct, uh, that you have you know the correct punctuation and. Uh, uh, capitalization and spelling out your acronyms again if you have any, all of those kinds of things. Um, so again, the same sort of rules apply to a social media post, wherever it might be. And so that also includes the, uh, the alternative text for images. Now, not every uh, social network is going to have these controls, unfortunately. But uh, in this example, this was for uh, on, on LinkedIn, uh, we did have those controls to be able to, to uh, uh, add alternative text to, to the image. So of course we, we did. Um, so a few other good things to keep in mind here is to you know, use clear call to action. Um, when we're adding hashtags, uh, there's a specific format that is best for screen readers. So it's kind of that, you know, using uppercase, the, uppercasing the, the first letter of a new word. 
um, actually I should just to show that example here, like how we have you know DrupalCon Portland or open source. Uh, so just you know keeping to that that type of, of formatting of your of your text. Um, using a reasonable number of emojis. I didn't use any in this case, but you know, using too many is gonna become a little bit too difficult for someone to understand or maybe a little bit too redundant even, uh, confusion. Um, so don't, don't go, go overboard with the emojis or even other special characters. It might be common to see like, you know, if, you, if you do this one way, if you can invert your text or something fun like that, but that's gonna be really hard for somebody to understand what that, what that means. And if you're doing videos, for example, linking to uh, or having uh, a transcript and, and even, you know, of course, um, uh, captions on those videos. Um, so making sure that those captions are available depending, again, on the social network. If it's uh, YouTube uh, and LinkedIn, they actually, they'll both give you automatic uh, uh, captioning. Um, that's that's going to be great. Uh, it makes it pretty easy. But do also make sure that you're sort of checking over that captions because, as we all know, you know, AI and, and some of this automation can have some errors and we just want to make sure that it's not going to cause confusion or that it's still going to be understandable for people. So make sure that you check it over for accuracy, the timing of, of, the, of the, the captions. Again, spelling, punctuation is pretty important. It might help differentiate a, a word from a name, for example. Um, so using those, uh, the, those, those features that the platform gives you will, will help out a lot with making sure that your, your videos are, are accessible. So one of the main takeaways that I hope you've gotten from what we've presented today is that um, having this holistic approach to accessible content and really thinking about the whole life cycle, but also all the people involved in those different steps of the life cycle is going to give you better results than just having one person who's the expert of accessibility and who's holding all that knowledge in their head. Um, really seeing accessibility as something that's part of your organizational culture, um, something that you're not afraid to teach your colleagues about. Um, you know, maybe it's someone in a different department who's creating PDFs or someone who you have to pull in to add images or um, do video work for you or publish things to social media. Sharing those best practices with all those people who are part of this content publishing life cycle, um, giving them the tools, getting them excited about using different um, different testing tools or, or different techniques um, is going to set you up for success. Um, and so I, I feel like the more that I work in this space, the more people I find who are motivated by accessibility and who want to learn. Um, so I think I'm probably preaching a bit to the choir here, but um, just seeing it as something that you can also spread to other colleagues on, on your team, I think is really the best way to think about it. Um, so, bef just before we open it up to questions, uh, we wanted to share uh, that Evolving Web uh, organizes lots of Drupal events. We have a couple coming up, one in Montreal in June and one in New York in September. Um, so if you love this experience at DrupalCon and you like sessions like this and you want to learn more and share what you're learning, um, we'd love to see you at those events. Um, and again, you can also always reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and with that, we can open it up for questions or comments, or we'd love to hear also about tools and things that you're using, anything that we didn't mention. Um, we'd love to hear from folks in the crowd. Yes. Uh, tools, are you familiar accessibi with accessibility? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of them out there. Um, I, I think that they are probably, I, they're probably solving uh, like underlying problems that should probably be solved in a different way. Um, they, I'm not convinced that they really have a, 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 a big place. Uh, and they can they rely heavily on you know JavaScript and that can cause certain problems and um, there's a, there's there's a lot of, of underlying issues there uh, but they certainly you know they're growing they're they become more 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 popular um, oh sorry yes that's a good point so basically it's like you know I'm sure everybody has sort of seen 
these things when you're browsing around the web. You'll see a little uh, toolbar pop up in the bottom corner of your screen that's like the accessibility icon, and you tap on it and it opens up a whole bunch of controls that will give you like options to uh, invert contrast or um, to make text bigger, those kinds of, of, of accessibility controls. Um, and so th there's uh, the, the one in the question was about accessibility. Um, there's uh, a, a whole bunch of other ones, um, uh, maybe Reach Deck or uh, what are some other ones off the top of my head. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're all just trying to, trying to help out solving these problems. And, and that's a great thing, to be able to make the web a more accessible place. So they have, they have good intentions, I think, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll solve some of, some of the problems that they introduce as well. But I would just maybe just advise caution against looking to, to those as a, as a one-stop solution for everything. Uh, I think maybe that's the, the end goal is that, or the, 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 the specific point might just be that it's, it's not a one-stop solution. It's so much more complicated than just installing a new thing on your site and saying it's accessible. There's a lot that has to go into to, to becoming uh, accessible. So um, don't look to that for the solution, but if, if it solves specific needs, then maybe it'll, it'll be a great uh, uh, part of the solution. Yes, at the back. A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sorry, what's your name? John Lockhart. John Lockhart at, uh, from University of Edinburgh. So just to kind of um, echo what you're saying uh, and to put it on the recording in case folks are listening, um, there's this idea that instead of content publishers having to know so much about accessibility, it would be great if the content management system would just take care of, it, of that. And that becomes easier the more that you use structured content and fields and components that uh, you know are asking you for the information instead of giving you a WYSIWYG editor are asking for specific fields and then it takes care of it on the template side. Okay, I'm gonna put these fields into a into uh, HTML that is already accessible. Um, places where I see this being really important are things like, um, you know, having complete, giving the content author complete flexibility over the order of components on a page can be a really big problem if the first component on the page has to have an H1 and somebody says, oh, I'm gonna drag the hero down to the bottom of the page and then the H1's in the wrong spot. Um, so sometimes as people building the CMS, which a lot of us here are, are doing, we have to think ahead and say, okay, well actually you can't change where that component is going to be or it's not going to be the same kind of, it's not going to be the same kind of drag and drop component, it's going to be a fixed set of fields at the top of the page. So that type of thing is the thing we have to think through when we're building a CMS. At the same time, there are things in this presentation about like, you know, writing a link text within the, the um, content of an article, um, which I, I think is gonna be very hard to get your CMS to do for you. Um, I'm excited about things like AI tools that might AI tools that might flag issues like that with your content and tell you like, oh, the link text that you put really makes no sense if you <laughs> take it out of context. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, like there's still there's still some part of this that content folks have to to think about. But I I love the idea of just doing it more through the CMS. Trust no one. <laughs> yeah, and the other um, uh, the other module that we should um, add to our presentation is editorially, which was developed, I believe, by Princeton University and um, is a great tool for content editors that you can install just as a, mo a free module. 
Uh, there's a question here. Perfect. Yeah. So another um, vote for using editorially, <laughs> as well as site improve, which is similar to Debbot, which um, which Jesse was showing earlier. I think there was there were two people at the back. Okay. I see. I see you. You're still here. Absolutely, yeah. So, Dubbot, you know more about the details than I do, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, the question was if, if Dubbot is a uh, paid uh, service, and uh, indeed it is. Um, I don't know exactly the, the, the pricing model, um, but uh, if I remember correctly, it's not quite as, uh, as expensive as, say, something like Site Improve, um, but it is, it is definitely a paid uh, service. Um, so, it, it you know, provides a lot of features that, that I think justify some of that, but it is, yeah, it is definitely a paid service. And in general, what you're going to find is that if you're looking for something that's going to just give you, is this page accessible, um, like a page by page kind of audit, um, you're going to be able to find lots of free tools that do that, and even Site Improve has a, uh, a free tool to just assess the page you're on. Um, but if you're looking for something that's going to run more of a full scale, look at every single page on my site and give me um, uh, you know, results of how accessible is this, and then monitor that over time and show you progress, those are the types of auditing tools that you're going to end up uh, paying for it because it's handling more content and has that kind of organizational memory that people are looking for when they're s trying to show their boss, oh, I'm making progress with the accessibility. You know, we're up to from 70 to 90 percent. Um, that's what you pay for. Yeah. And so for the, in terms of the, the more free solutions, I would definitely recommend, I mean, editorially, but also uh, Wave and Axe are the two browser extensions that will look at the individual page that, that you're visiting. That's great. Yeah. So two two comments. I'll just um, I'll just echo and add to them. So first, pool your resources to pay for stuff like Site Improve. That's a great tip. Um, with different maybe different departments get together to get a subscription. Um, and the other thing is around actually getting users with disabilities to to help you with testing. I know that's not always um, feasible, um, but definitely uh, from my experience finding a friend with a severe vision impairment really gave me this interesting insight that I want to share. Um, not everybody with a vision impairment goes straight for a screen reader. Um, you might already know this, um, but a lot of people have a vision impairment that they can, they can still see, but they really cannot see as well as you, you might assume. And so when they are not going to use a screen reader, it's going to be easier for them to actually use the view the page, but maybe use something like a magnifier or other tools to really zoom in on the content. And so they're using the website in a way that we might not um, you know, expect or predict. Um, and so they're, they're benefiting from a lot of the accessibility best practices like high contrast or um, having the zooming of, t of, uh, of typography work, scaling of typography work really well, or having 
elements that are in close proximity when they're related. Um, but just watching somebody with a disability like this using a website uh, can be really eye-opening, and so I hi highly recommend that, that tip. Thank you for sharing. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, what, uh, yes. Centers for Accessibility Testing to, to help you with that um, type of testing with actual users. And last question at the back there, I know you. Yeah, so um, appropriate, I mean, guardrails. appropriate guardrails versus design flexibility, striking the right balance. This is uh, always, always the biggest challenge. So i um, glad we're having this conversation. And um, thanks, everyone, for participating. Thanks for all the great questions. And feel free to come up and chat with us more. Thank you.